Hello, welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we will continue our reading of Cheerfulness Breaks In by Angela Thurkill. Delia being now claimed by the archdeacon, Lydia found herself at liberty to deal with Mr. Needham, tucked up her wristbands and came into the ring, asking her neighbor how he had been getting on. Mr. Needham said quite well, thank you, and how charming Miss Brandon, whom he hadn't met before, was. Oh, Delia, said Lydia, she's awfully nice, but I shouldn't have thought you'd have noticed it. I thought it was her mother you were gone on. Most people are. Of course, I do admire Mrs. Brandon frightfully, said Mr. Needham, casting a sheep's eye across the table to where Mrs. Brandon was enjoying herself with Mr. Burkett. But there's something, there is something so very nice about Miss Brandon. She's so very pretty. That's why she's engaged, said Lydia, determined that Mr. Needham should not be distracted from the one suitable object. She told me before dinner. Oh, said Mr. Needham, a little dashed. I should have thought you might have noticed her ring, said Lydia severely, considering which finger it's on. How's Octavia? I mean, is Matron being horrible? I didn't have time to ask before dinner. I think Matron is being very unfair, said Mr. Needham chivalrously. She has put the worst abdominal in D ward, and Octavia was just going in for abdominals, because she says she has enough head wounds and wants more general experience. Octavia was marvelous about it. I wish I thought about my work as much as she does, but then she's doing real work, and I'm— That's enough, Tommy, said Lydia. I told you before that you were doing jolly good. I think Octavia looks ripping tonight. She looked firmly across at Octavia, who was certainly not looking any less uninteresting than usual, and finding Mr. Keith curiously unsympathetic to her account of a patient who had had a heart attack. She makes me think of some heroine, said Mr. Needham, and I feel so ashamed for myself. I know I couldn't be a hero, but oh, shut up, Tommy, said Lydia, exasperated. I'd hit you on the back if it weren't a dinner party. What about you being a military chaplain? Then if you got wounded, Octavia could nurse you. Mr. Needham's eyes gleamed. And now let me tell, and now tell me about the choir school football team, said Lydia, feeling as she had done enough for Mr. Needham's love affairs. He needed no encouragement to tell her all she didn't want to know, and she was able to listen in a kind of dream, her thoughts in the past on a cold winter's day, walking on the terrace at Northbridge Manor. All this time, Mr. Miller had been comparing notes with Mrs. Burkett about evacuees, and Mrs. Burkett had secretly come to the conclusion, as she always did, that Mr. Miller was that nicest of things, a really good person who was wholly unconscious of being good and felt that only a devil would have disliked most of the Southbridge evacuees as much as she did, so that it was quite a comfort to her when Mr. Miller confessed that he had harbored unchristian thoughts against the worst of their boys, who had drowned six chickens and kicked the hen and broke her leg. "'What did you do, Mr. Miller?' Mrs. Burkett asked. "'The old Adam rose in me, and I beat him,' said Mr. Miller, "'not even after reflection, I fear, but in anger.' Then I'm certain you did him a great deal of good, said Mrs. Burkett firmly, and probably saved him from the gallows later. That is what my dear wife said, said Mr. Miller, casting an adoring look at Mrs. Miller, who was in the middle of the mother's union with the dean. And indeed, indeed, I hope that it may be so, though I fear the gallows are still gaping for that boy. He has been trying to dig to Australia among the lettuces, thus causing considerable loss of good food. But my wife is the greatest comfort in these trials, and her influence over the boys is astounding. By now, Noel was well in possession of Miss Pettinger, but much to his annoyance, the game of Pettinger baiting, to which he had promised himself, had lost its savor. It was not that Miss Pettinger had lost hers, for her horribleness was more pronounced than ever, but instead of being amused, Noel found her simply boring. Dinner seemed to him quite interminable. After what felt like hours of the Pettinger's voice, he suddenly heard the words Lydia Keith and came to attention with a jerk. Lydia Keith and Delia Brandon and the dear Dean's Octavia and so many more of our old Barcastrians are doing excellent work, Miss Pettinger was saying, worthy of the very best traditions of Barchester High School. I was very much gratified to have a letter this morning from Miss Wixett, our first headmistress, and still among us at Lyme Regis, I'm glad to say, bidding us all Godspeed in our work. I read her letter aloud to my girls after prayers. How like you, said Noel admiringly. I'm sure it is largely due to your influence that Octavia and the others are doing such good work. <laughs>
This appalling lie was, as Noel fully realized, merely a bait to Miss Pettinger to go on talking about Lydia, though for some reason Noel found it impossible to mention her name at the moment and had to include her among others. I do my best to carry on the wonderful traditions of our old school, said Miss Pettinger, bridling, and I think I can say that no girl passes the school certificate from Barchester High School without being in some way molded or even changed for the good. I'm sure Octavia was, said Noel generously. Dear Octavia is just the type that we wish to turn out, said Miss Pettinger, looking with an almost human look at her ex-pupil's dull but self-satisfied face. I know I would feel exactly the same about her, said Noel, with the pleasant certainty that Miss Pettinger would not understand. As for dear Lydia, said Miss Pettinger, she is a warm-hearted girl, but I could wish she had had the honor of the school more at heart. She never seemed to realize the importance of attending to every rule in the school's code of honor. I remember that in her last summer term I had to give her four red marks and one black mark for repeatedly hanging her shoe bag on the wrong peg in the senior cloakroom. Now, her elder sister Kate was quite different, so conscientious, and her sister-in-law, Mrs. Robert Keith, who was Edith Fairweather, was a wonderful influence among the girls, so good at hockey and cricket, and keenly interested in the Barcastriana, our school magazine. It is a pity that Lydia has not kept up with us more. She has only come to one old girls' reunion since she left. She does not look to me so fit as I like to see our old girls. I wish she would take up nursing or land work or some healthy form of war activity, but one cannot well interfere. No, indeed, said Noel, who, having gained his wish and heard Miss Pettinger speak of Lydia, would now have liked to strangle her. But at this moment, Mrs. Crawley collected her lady's eyes and rose. The conversation of women is, on the whole, so much more interesting than that of gentlemen that we will leave the dean and his guests to discuss local and world affairs and waft ourselves up to the drawing room. Here, Mrs. Brandon, true to her promise, seated herself on the little green settee, but did not fluffle out her dress because she wanted to talk to Mrs. Crawley. "'Come and sit with me,' she said to her hostess. "'I want to tell you about Delia before it is in the Times. She's going to marry our nice cousin Hilary Grant. I'm telling everyone, so really the Times will almost be a war extravagance, but one cannot quite get engaged without it.' Mrs. Crawley expressed warm congratulations and was glad to hear that Hillary would not at present be in danger. We are all in danger, said Mrs. Brandon stoutly, not wishing anyone to think that Delia would be too comfortable. Mrs. Crawley said that it was in a way a comfort. No, I really can't agree with you, said Mrs. Brandon with one of her devastating attacks of truthfulness. It would be much nicer if we weren't, only one doesn't quite know where to draw the line. If all the children and everyone under about 30 were safe, it would be so much more comfortable and it wouldn't matter so much about us, except for all the ones that are being really useful, like, like your husband and Sir Edmund and the Burkitts, and practically everybody one knows. But what is really annoying, because though it may not be dangerous, it is very worrying for her friends, or at least the people who know her, is Hillary's mother. What has happened to her, said Mrs. Crawley. Nothing, said Mrs. Brandon, which is just what I complain of, because she will not leave Calabria, where she lodges with a very short, stout chemist and his wife, who is often a bandit in a small way, at least he is, called Marco Aurelio, and is look, writing a book about Calabrian folklore, which she knows far too intimately. And I'm so afraid Hillary will feel he ought to go out and bring her home, which she certainly would not do, and would be a very great trial to everyone when she got here, owing to having no settled home. She spent a few weeks at the cow and sickle in the village when she was here last, in England, and owing to her trying to teach Mrs. Spindler to cook macaroni in the Calabrian way with goat's cheese, which of course one luckily cannot get, Mrs. Spindler has hated me ever since, though all I did was to go and to call on Mrs. Grant once or twice. I think I met her at, ladies, at Lady Norton's, said Mrs. Crawley, all homespun and sensible shoes. And hung with distressed jewelry, said Mrs. Brandon, and do tell me all about your family. This Mrs. Crawley was not averse to doing, and when duty compelled her to move on to Miss Pettinger, who was being held at bay valiantly by Mrs. Miller, who made her promise to lend the school hall for a summer meeting of GFS branches before she could think of an excuse, Mrs. Brandon fluffled her dress and sat all over the little green settee looking like a delicious double sweet pea, so that the archdeacon's daughter, who wanted to tell her about her engagement to Guy Barton, had to bring up a little stool.
I'm very fond of Guy, said the archdeacon's daughter, clasping her competent workman's hands around her knees. He used to be a bit of an ass, but we've all got on well, and the RAF will do him a world of good. I don't think we'll get married yet, because I've got all the land girls to organize for West Barsetshire, either after the war or when he is invalided out if he crashes. Mrs. Brandon, not quite sure how much of this detachment was real, how much a mask, said she didn't know Mr. Barton, but she had heard how very nice he was. A bit too nice, if you ask me, said the archdeacon's daughter dispassionately. He didn't behave frightfully well to Phoebe Rivers when he was engaged to her, but he won't do that again. Wasn't she a cousin of Lord Pomfret's, a good-looking girl, very smart, said Mrs. Brandon. Jolly good-looking, said the archdeacon's daughter. She married Humberton, Lord Platfield's eldest son, down at Shropshire. I was a bridesmaid, and Lord Humberton can't stand Phoebe's mother, so that's all right. It was a nasty slap in the eye for Guy, and I had to take him in hand. And now the men came in, and Lowell advan Noel advanced upon Mrs. Brandon, who suddenly shrank to half her former size, and smiled to him to sit, sit down beside her. "'Need I say how exquisite you are looking?' said Noel. "'Of course you need,' said Mrs. Brandon. "'It is only women who trouble to tell other women that they look nice, so coming from a man it has great value. But this dress is a rag.' You are not only the most charming, but the most untruthful woman I know, said Noel, so that they both laughed. And now, said Mrs. Brandon, who would undoubtedly have tapped him with her fan if she had had one, what is it you want to say? And pray be quick, for I see the dean's eye on me. It is difficult to be quick, said Noel, because, you see, I have never fallen in love before, and I am a little shamefaced about it. Mrs. Brandon's enchanting face assumed the expression of a child who sees a very large ice pudding. "'Do you mean you want to tell me about it?' she said. "'I do, Lavinia,' said Noel, and nobody else. "'Is it Lydia?' said Mrs. Brandon, pretending, as she spoke, to assure the fastening of, of one of her diamond earrings, so that her face was half concealed from the room by her arm. "'How did you know?' said Noel, utterly taken aback. "'Because I've seen it coming ever since the vicarage fete at Pomfret Madrigal two years ago,' said Mrs. Brandon placidly. "'And I must say I have been an extremely good warming pan for your attentions, though to call it chandelier, as the French do, is much more elegant, and I hope you are grateful.' "'Devil!' said Noel, looking so affectionately at Mrs. Brandon that Lydia Keith, who happened to be looking that way, couldn't help noticing it and almost wishing she were Mrs. Brandon." In a less sophisticated age, Mrs. Brandon would automatically have said, Oh, you naughty man, but though she was quite capable of such an anachronism, she merely smiled one of her most bewitching smiles and asked if she could help. I don't know, said Noel. You see, I never knew it till you see, I never knew it till all that cold weather we had, and now I can't help reflecting that I'm a great deal older than she is and might lose a perfect friend by trying to gain a wife. Do you think she would consider my application? Oh, of all the nincompoops, said Mrs. Brandon, which made Noel, who, although considerably her junior, had always felt like her contemporary, suddenly realize that she looked upon him as a young man, not belonging to the real world of grown-up people. You think I could then, he said? How long are you on leave, said Mrs. Brandon. Noel said he had to go back to town by the night train in about an hour. "'Well, you might manage it tonight, though it would be difficult,' said Mrs. Brandon. "'If you can't, you must do it the very next time you get leave.' "'Thank you, Lavinia. You are an angel,' said, Miss, said Noel. "'And if you don't, you need never come to stories again,' said Mrs. Brandon. "'Oh, Dr. Crawley, I did so want to talk to you. What did you think the bishop's wife said to at Lady Norton's the other day?' Noel took this conge and said, and the dean, saying that whatever that woman said would be in keeping with the palace traditions, sat down beside her to go gossip. Noel looked toward Lydia, but she was conversing so earnestly with Mr. Needham in a corner that he suddenly felt old and fell to talking with the colonial bishop. It was not altogether of Lydia's own will that she was talking again to Mr. Needham, but that young gentleman had waylaid her to explain to her all over again his efforts to be a military chaplain. "'I believe I could get to France now,' said Mr. Needham, "'because two or three of the people who deal with that are old internationals, but I can't decide if it is my duty or if I'm only being selfish. After all, I am a priest.' 
A clergyman, you mean, said Lydia severely. Priest sounds like a monk. Look here, Tommy, have you read the 39 articles? Did you mean the 39 steps, said Mr. Needham, who could not believe his ears. A year or two earlier, Lydia would have said, of course not, you great fool. But that arrogant Lydia was far away. And Miss Lydia Keith said to Mr. Needham that she meant articles and supposed he was a Christian. Thus challenged, Mr. Needham said rather huffily that he saw no point in such a question. I'm only trying to help you, said Lydia patiently. I've been reading it myself, and I must say I think it's a frightfully good bit of work. I mean, there's room for everyone in it, and it says that it is lawful for Christian men to wear weapons and serve in the wars, so there you are. And if you want a magistrate to command you, I know Sir Edmund would, or Mr. Keith, they're both JPs. At this jumbled and earnest piece of special pleading, the scales fell from Mr. Needham's eyes, and to his intense joy and relief, he suddenly saw the paths of duty and desire for once coinciding. With real gratitude and humility, he thanked Lydia. That's all right, Tommy, said Lydia, only don't ask anyone's advice again. You just go ahead. Do you think I ought to tell Octavia, said Mr. Needham? Of course, said Lydia, and I'd tell her at once if I were you. If I had anything to offer, said Mr. Needham, do you think she would wait for me till I came back? Or perhaps it wouldn't be fair to ask her. Don't be an ass, said Lydia, with a flash of her old impatience. Take her for a walk when she comes off duty tomorrow and tell her everything. Then Sir Edmund, who was very fond of Lydia, came limping upon her, and she exerted herself to be the kind of girl Sir Edmund liked and gave him an amusing evening. The party broke up early, and by half past ten the guests had said goodbye to Mrs. Crawley and assembled in the hall for their last glimpse of light before plunging into the blackout. Lydia, waiting for her father to get his coat and hat on, found Mr. Needham at her elbow. I asked Octavia if she would have a walk with me tomorrow, he said in a voice of subdued excitement, and she was going to an extra lecture on peritonitis, but she's going to cut it for me. You are an angel, Lydia, he said vehemently. Write to me at once, won't you, said Lydia. I can't tell you how happy I am. And she slipped her arm through Mr. Needham's and gave it a friendly and encouraging squeeze. Sorry, Noel, she said as she bumped her elbow against Mr. Merton, who had been jammed between Sir Edmund and the Archdeacon, and so had, very unwillingly, heard Mr. Needham call Lydia an angel, and Lydia beg Mr. Needham to write, besides seeing her take that young gentleman's arm. He was used to his Lydia's ebullient ways, but he found himself hating Mr. Needham in a most unseemly way for being so much younger than himself. Goodbye, Noel, said Mrs. Brandon, all furred and cloaked, for these phrases come naturally to one's mind when speaking of her. Don't forget. You may command me in anything, said Noel. Bless you. And he lifted her hand to his lips, for she was one of the few women he knew who would take such homage with grace. Owing to the squash, Lydia could not disentangle her arm from Mr. Needham's in time and not to see what she saw, hear what she heard. Goodbye, Lydia, said Noel. Shall I see you when I get my next leave? Of course, said Lydia, wondering as they shook hands. Their eyes met, asking questions that this was no time, no place to answer. Lydia drove home with her father, and Noel caught the night train to London, each thinking, just like people in novels, that the other's heart was not so warm, not so near, each determined to die sooner than infringe in a hair's breadth the freedom of the other. Chapter 15, Story Without an End. The loveliest spring that England could remember had emerged from the long, hard winter and went flashing by in luxuriant riot into early summer at cinema speed. And with the quick and profuse blossoming of almond, wild cherry, hawthorn, red, white, and pink, buttercups, lilac, laburnum, with the onward rush of the trees from a mist of tender green to a heavy and sullen leafage, the rush of events came thundering down from the Arctic Circle across the Low Countries, marshaled by the powers of darkness. The Earl of Pomfret died quietly in the small hours of the morning early in May. I do not think he had any fears or regrets. His heir, whom he had had at first mistrusted and gradually come to value, would carry on, under changed conditions, work for which he knew he would soon have been unfit, and had already two sons, 
His heir's wife he liked and respected, for she had the best hands in the country and good common sense. They were both by his bed when his eyes failed to see the sunlight flooding his room. He held a hand of each and spoke the name of his dead wife and the son who had been killed a lifetime ago in a frontier skirmish. The eighth Earl of Pomfret looked down on the seventh Earl and took up his burden. Old Lord Pomfret was buried quietly in the parish churchyard. There was a memorial service at St. Margaret's Westminster for the outer world. Then there was a memorial service in Barchester Cathedral, attended by the whole county, high and low, the last time that many of those in the great congregation were to see each other again. Lydia Keith and her father were among those present. Lydia had half hoped she might see Noel Merton in the deanery pew, but when he was not there she knew that her thoughts had been self-delusion. She went home by train alone, for her father was to stay on in Barchester for a committee and dine with his son Robert to discuss some business of the firm. Mrs. Keith had not been so well and depended more and more on Lydia, who handled her mother with firm and unaltering kindness. Lydia and her father knew that Mrs. Keith's heart was less satisfactory each month, and they both felt a chill shadow of private grief among the shadow of general sadness and apprehension, and both bore the shadow with courage and worked all the harder. But the shadow was not to touch Mr. Keith. When he left Robert's home that evening, he walked down to the country club where he had left his car in the morning. In the uncertain light, he stepped into the road in front of a stationary car, was hit by a lorry, and taken unconscious to the Barchester Hospital. He had only done what thousands of people do every day and paid the penalty. The lorry driver was in no way to blame, rather to be pitied for the sense of guilt that Mr. Keith's carelessness must have caused him. Lydia was fetched by her brother Robert early next morning. As Mrs. Keith was used to her husband and daughter being out and about before she came down, she felt no alarm. Mr. Keith lingered, always unconscious, for two days and then died without recognizing Robert or Lydia. It had been necessary to tell Mrs. Keith that her husband was injured, and this Robert and Lydia had managed with much kindness so that she was not made ill as they had feared. When she had to be told that her husband was dead, she was more stunned than unhappy. Luckily, Nurse Chaffinch, an excellent nurse who had been with old Doc Lord Pomfret and was known to Mrs. Moreland, could be secured and was installed to look after Mrs. Keith for the present. Lydia, who had prepared herself for her mother's possible death, was shaken to the core by this turn of fate, but held valiantly to her post. Robert's wife offered to come and stay with her, as did her own sister Kate, but with many thanks Lydia said she could manage it better alone. Robert took over all business matters for her. Northbridge Manor was left to him. As he and his wife had no wish to live there at present, it was agreed that part of the house would be shut up and Mrs. Keith go on living there for the present under Nurse Chaffinch's care, while Lydia would do her capable best with the estate and all Mr. Keith's local activities. And we will find out, as far as one can, what ultimately happens to Lydia next time.